bless. And God blesses. And God blessed this man abundantly. Finally, it came to the place where Jacob's herdsmen had so many animals that they're eating up all the grass. All these animals eating up all the grass that the herdsmen of Laban said, we need for you to leave. And so the separation began to take place. And as he was departing, Genesis chapter 32 and verse 9 says then Jacob said O God my father Abraham O God of my father Abraham and God of my father Isaac the Lord who said to me return to your country and to your family and I will deal well with you I am not worthy of the least of all the mercies and all the truth which you have shown your servant for I crossed over this Jordan with my staff he said I came with just a stick in my hand that's all he had and a promise from God I crossed over this Jordan with my staff, and now I have become two companies. Deliver me, I pray, from the hand of my brother, at the hand of Esau. Now what was happening here is that Jacob was about ready to come to a day of reckoning. God had told him, Jacob, go back to your homeland. I will bless you there. And so he comes back, and he realizes Esau is waiting for him, and Esau has 400 men with him. And so he's thinking he's come to pay back. He's come to attack me. He's come to hurt me. And so Jacob divided his family into two different companies. They went two different directions. And he sent some people out there to meet Esau to find out what kind of spirit he was and what was going on about this. And in the meantime, here's Jacob, and he's praying, and he's saying, Oh, God. He said, God, I'm, at, I'm honoring you. I'm doing exactly what you're telling me to do. And he says, I'm coming to this, and I want you to notice this. In verse 11, he said, Deliver me, I pray, from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau, for I fear him. Lest he come and attack me, and the mother with the children. I fear him. Remember last week we talked about Abraham was so honest with God. Job was honest with God. Here is Jacob, he's honest with God. He's saying, God, I have a real concern here that I'm going to be destroyed. I'm afraid of this thing. You know it's okay to tell God you're afraid of something? It's okay to say, God, I don't have any faith at all for what's going to take place here. Help me in my unbelief. God, I need strength in this. And, and he turns to his God and he says, I fear of what is going to happen. But here's what took place. In the face of his fear, when Jacob could have turned around and ran away and said, I don't want to have anything to do with this. Instead, he honored God. He, God said, go. And no matter what was going to happen, nothing was going to deter him from following God. And here's the spiritual principle. One of the most powerful aspects that we can have in supernatural eyesight is we stick to what God has told you to do, even when any, everything in the natural suggests that you shouldn't do it. Well, come to find out, Esau wasn't mad at him at all. Esau opened up his arms and welcomed his brother and embraced him. He said, I don't need anything from you. God's blessed me as well. Starting in verse 24, Jacob gets into his famous wrestling match. The Bible says he was wrestling a man. And he was wrestling him all night. And again, word studies, if you look at this, that word wrestling was not just that they were rolling around together. They were in a knockdown, drag out fight. All night long he was wrestling this man. And this man says, let me go, Jacob, I have to go. And Jacob said, I'm not going to let you go. I'm going to hang on to you. And this man touched him in the hip and knocked his hip out of joint. Still, Jacob wouldn't let him go. It was a knockdown, drag out fight until the very morning. And this man said, it's becoming morning. I have to go. And Jacob said, I am not going to let you go unless you bless me. What's your name? My name is Jacob. I'm a supplanter. I'm the one that tries to overpower other people. And this man said, no longer will you be called Jacob. You're going to be called Israel. Do a word study on this. Because we've, I've heard it all my life of what that really means. Look it up in the Strong's Concordance. Pull it up. And here's what it says. The word Israel literally means you will rule as God. Think about that. You will rule as God. 
I mean, that's something that we, how can we even touch that? Who are we to rule as God? Who is this man to rule as God? But something had happened in his life, such a transformation had taken place all these years, he began to understand who God was. He began to understand the character of who God is. He understood what God's plan and God's purpose was for himself and his descendants, and he understood that the decisions that he could make, he could make because he had first seen it in the spiritual realm. You remember Jesus said, he said, I don't do anything except first I see my father do it. As soon as I see my father do it, he sets the example, then I'm going to do it. The great miracles that he performed, he first saw it in the spiritual realm. We see Jacob as well. He said, what I am doing, I'm fulfilling in the spiritual realm what God showed me to do. I'm doing what the Lord asked me to do. This is what he wants me to do. And I'm going to act on behalf of him in this world today. And I'm going to rule as God. Not that he was God, but he had heard from God. If he had heard from God, then he was going to act like this is God's will. And it's going to take place. I'm not going to call you Jacob anymore, God said. I'm going to call you Israel. And that's who that man was that he was wrestling with. He was wrestling with God. And this is something that we kind of gloss over sometimes. When it was all over said and done, Jacob said, I'm going to call this place Peniel. Which means I saw God face to face and I live to tell about it several years later Moses said no man has ever seen God face to face and lived Jacob said he saw God face to face and that was the thing that would amaze him he said I lived through this thing I survived this thing from that point on he walked differently he was a different man. He was a different person. And the transformation of Jacob was complete. From Jacob to Israel, he gone from a heel grabber to the man who will rule as God. And all along the way, his wonderful supernatural experiences with God, he could understand the things of God in a greater way, more profoundly, more deeply. And the transformation, friend, is something that every single one of us need to go through. We need to go through this very same transformation from a sinner to a saint. Not by our own power, but through the power of the Holy Spirit. Here's the spiritual principles. We must have a life-changing experience with God. Some people have never experienced that. They've gone to church their entire life. They never have had an encounter with God. They've had an encounter with other people. They've had an encounter with religion. But they never have had an encounter with God. If you have an encounter with God, your life is going to change. You'll never be the same person again. Old things are passed away, the Bible says, and all things become new. Here's another spiritual principle we learned through it. Believe God's promises. And if you just say, I believe God's promises, your faith begins to develop. You realize even if it's a setback, it's not a denial. Even if it looks like it's not going to happen, doesn't mean it's not going to happen. It still will if God said it will. You believe by faith. Here's another spiritual principle. He was gracious and he was giving. And other people prospered because of his blessing. But he didn't mind. He realized he was blessed to be a blessing. Here's another spiritual principle. He was honest before God. He resulted. All this resulted in a supernatural experience. Unlike any man had ever had before. He saw God face to face, and he lived. He had a real insight into God. I'm going to talk about his son just for a few moments. I'm not going to go into great, de great detail, but these two things tie in. The transformation took place in Jacob's life. He had a son named Joseph, and Joseph had special gifts. He had dreams, and he could interpret dreams. If you know the story of Joseph, you know that Joseph had tremendous insight into God's plan and who God was. Joseph was betrayed by his brothers. He was sold into slavery. He became a servant in a man named Potiphar's house. He served him well, and he served him with uprightness and with honesty. He was exalted to the highest place in the home. In his home, all that Potiphar owned, he said, you can take care of. There's one thing you don't take care of, and that's my wife. Understandable. But Potiphar's wife, as you know, the story went after him and tried to seduce him, and Joseph ran out of there, and, and the Bible says he left his coat in her arms. 
And she told all the servants, said, look what this Hebrew has done. He tried to hurt me. He tried to seduce me. And I have proof of it. Joseph went from that position to where he was in prison. And when he was in prison, even there he was exalted to a place of leadership. He was allowed to be like second over in, under the guards. And he, and he took care of the people that was there. See, he had, he had a gift. He had a gift. And he had the blessing. And even through all of this, God brought him two men. One was Pharaoh's cupbearer, and one was Pharaoh's baker. And these men had dreams that they didn't understand the interpretation of those dreams. And Joseph interpreted those dreams for him. I want to tell you something about it. If a person truly interprets the dream properly, it may not be what you want to hear. Because to the cupbearer, he told him, he said, you're going to go back and you're going to be restored. Then he turns to the baker and he says, here's what your dream means. You're going to be hung. You're dead. You're going to die. And it happened. It happened. But Joseph said something. It's in Genesis 40 and verse 8. Joseph said to them, do not interpretations belong to God. Joseph had a connection with God. And he never one time took his gift to himself and saying look who I am he always said look who God is and he always gave credit to the Lord spiritual principle is this that we give credit to the Lord on every case every situation if something good is happening to God be the glory great things he has done so Joseph understood this he interpreted these dreams we also knew something else because he was connected to God he knew that God was going to use him Here's something that I feel we must, we must come into. We must come into an understanding that we are connected to the God Most High. The Bible says He has given certain gifts to us. Isn't that right? He said when He ascended on high, He gave gifts to men. Among those gifts, there's a numerous of them. Speaking in tongues, interpretation of tongues, prophecy, the word of wisdom, the word of knowledge. He's given us discerning of spirits. Given all these things to us as a gift to us. And if we see somebody who is in need, rather than trying to find out in our own experience or our own power how we can meet that need, if only we could turn to God and tap into his supernatural power. Because one word from God can change a person's life. One word from me can mean nothing. But when it comes directly from God, then that is a word from the Lord. It can put direction in their life. It can help them out. We need to turn to God and say, God, because I'm connected to you, You said these gifts can flow through me. We need to seek God for these gifts to operate in our life, in our church, wherever we are and wherever we happen to be. We need to have a spiritual hunger for the things of God on a level we say, God, use me to change somebody's life. Well, as the story goes on with Joseph, Pharaoh had a dream, two of them. He didn't understand any one of them. The Bible says he brought all of his magicians in, all these soothsayers, all these wise men. He told them the dream, and not one of them could interpret it. And as they're all looking at each other, trying to figure out what to do, the cupbearer raised his hand and says, Sir, he said, if I just may have a little bit of time, just let me say one thing. I know a man. He's a Hebrew man. And he's in prison. But he can interpret your dream. Bring him here, Pharaoh said. And as he comes before the mightiest man of the world, he interprets his dream for him. Chapter 41, verse 16 of Genesis. So Joseph answered Pharaoh, saying, It is not in me. God will give Pharaoh an answer of peace. I am not the one that can interpret this dream, but I serve a God who can interpret this dream for you. You see the pattern that is being laid out here. Always honor God. If God uses you in any way, always honor God. Always give him the glory for great things he has done. Here's a spiritual principle. The closer you get to God, the more you will seek to bring honor and praise to him. You will become like John the Baptist. John the Baptist said, I must decrease so that he might increase. I don't want people to see me. I want them to see Jesus. 
Let me hide who I am behind the cross. Let them see the Lord Jesus Christ in my life. So we've seen a pattern. In these three times over the last two weeks, Abraham refused to be blessed by man and risked man taking credit for God's blessing. Jacob refused to be blessed by man and risked man taking credit for God's blessings. And now Joseph refused to take credit for the actions of God in his life. It's a pattern. We want to have supernatural insight. We want to hear from God. We want to know what God desires of us. Seeing in the supernatural comes as a result of making yourself available to God and obeying Him. Somebody put it this way. We pray and we obey. We pray and we obey. If you have received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you should have experienced a change in your life. There should be a change of who you are. Driven by superficial, fleshly desires. Driven by lust. Driven by drugs. Driven by addiction. Driven by anger. Driven by vengeance. Driven by trying to get ahead like Jacob did any way you can. All these things, they change. And you transform into what God says that you can become a person who rules as God rules. I know that almost seems offensive on some level, but listen to me. In Ephesians chapter 1 and Ephesians chapter 2, the Bible says this. We are seated in the heavenly places with Christ Jesus. Did you know that? The heavenly places literally means it's above the sky. It's where God is. Where are we positioned today? We're living on this earth we got to go through the struggles of this earth. But spiritually, we're a position where Jesus is. Where is he? goes on and says that he is above all principalities and all powers and all spiritual forces and every demonic activity. He says he put all these things underneath his feet. Underneath his feet. goes on and talks about his feet. talks about his body being the church. That all the powers of darkness that are trying to destroy your life, all the activities of Satan is trying to come against you. You have power and you have authority over those things. Jesus said, I've given you authority. I've given you power. And he's given us his name. In the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and that are under the earth. I believe if we can adopt the spiritual principles, God will exalt you. If you just adopt these spiritual principles, God is going to lift you up. I was thinking about this the other day, trying to analyze how I interpret things and how I try to present the Word of God. People have asked me through the years, why don't you do it this way? Why don't you do it that way? Why don't you try something else? I feel like David trying to put on Saul's armor, trying to do what everybody else is telling me to do. But for me, to understand the Word of God is not so much just to bring out the history of it or the Greek or the Hebrew of it, but to try to find out what is the spiritual principle that is there. And there are principles in the Word of God, if we obey those principles, will bring us blessings in our life. Spiritual principle. If I can find out what God's principle is, here's one of God's principles. The Bible says, humble yourself before God, and He will exalt you. He will exalt you. No, God keeps His promises. What has God promised you? What has God promised you personally? What has he ministered to you? What has he said he's going to do in your life? Hang on to that. Say, God, I believe for the impossible. You don't have to defend yourself. If only we could grasp that. The Bible says in Romans, it says, do not return evil for evil. Abraham, evil came upon him. Jacob, evil came upon him. Job, evil came upon them. They did not retaliate with evil. They gave it up. They let it go. 
People have hurt you. People have done things to you. People have said things against you. People have, have criticized you, whatever. You have gone through experiences, and in your heart, you still hang on to that anger and that bitterness. You have to let it go because you can't replace evil with evil. No, the Bible says do good to those who have hurt you. It's a principle, and it works. Why does it work? Because it's God doing the work. And here's something that, that we need to understand. God loves people. Why do the wicked prosper? You ever wonder that? Why do good things happen to bad people all the time? We see people that do so many horrible, horrendous things, and yet it seems like they never get caught. I can drive five miles an hour over the speed limit, and I get a ticket. What's the deal with this? You know what? God knows how to reach people. God knows what it needed to touch a soul. God loves a murderer as much as he loves a liar. God loves people on the same level, and he wants people to come to know him. So I'm not judge and jury and executioner. I'm just a man. You're a man, woman, that's just proclaiming who he is. What we do, we show acceptance and we show love. And when we do that, God can then work in that person's life. I had a missionary come one time from, he was from the Ukraine. And during the, uh, the times that they were really persecuted, the, the, when it's USSR, they're persecuting the Christians. <coughs> Excuse me. They took this man and put him in prison. And in prison, he would beat every single day by a certain guard. And this guard would tell him all kinds of things about his family that was happening to this family. Talk about how that they were taking his wife and they were raping her every day. And how that they were abusing his children. So mentally he had to go through all that and physically every day he was beaten. He was a pastor. This man was a pastor. He loved God. And he made a choice. He said, I'm not going to return evil for evil. He said, I'm going to pray for those who abuse me. And he showed love to this man. He showed acceptance to him. Eventually, the man was set free. And when he was set free, the guard sought him out and told him, he said, I did what I did to you because I had to. I was under instructions. But he said, in all the evil I did to you, you never one time retaliated. All you did was show love and kindness to me. This man who was an atheist said, you have something in your life that I need and ask this man to pray for him that he might receive Christ and so he did he said it was one of the greatest honors that he had he prayed for the man who had persecuted him for so many years who had beat him every single day and he led that man to Jesus Christ that may not have happened had it not been for the principles that he followed he knew God People don't like you because you're a Christian. We're not to retaliate. We're to show the love of God. We're to show them how much Jesus loved them. So you don't have to defend yourself. All you have to do is just do what God asks you to do and give him glory for all the things that he has done. <clears throat> and God will honor you. I'm going to ask Roseanne to come, if you will. It's time for me to quit. i got a tickle in my throat, so I can't talk anymore. Somebody said, thank God for that. I want you to stand. You've been sitting for a while. Stand with me. Holy Spirit, you're welcome here this morning. Holy Spirit, you're welcome in our hearts and in our lives today. Father, I pray that you bring health and healing emotionally, spiritually, and physically to your church. I pray that we would understand in your word through these great men of God of the past how we are to conduct our lives. And simply by doing that, you will speak to us. Help us today to understand 
to have spiritual eyesight, to have ears that will hear you. Lord, we trust you today. I trust you today. I trust you today. Rejection is a horrible thing to experience. When you've done everything you can in the natural, still you feel like you've been rejected by somebody that you wanted them to accept you. It's a horrible experience. It's something that the devil can come and just wear you out. Why did they treat me that way? Why did they act that way? Why did they walk away? And the devil will just come and just try to twist this thing into your heart and your spirit. If you have experienced that rejection, I want to tell you something. God has never rejected you. He will never reject you. And God's plan and God's purpose for you has never changed. He loves you right now as much as he ever has. His purpose and his plan for you has never changed. And through all that has happened in life, God still is going to take care of you and he's going to bless you. You're going through stages in your life like we all do. You're walking through experiences in your life. You're being tested. How do I react, How do I react to this rejection? How do I respond to what's happening in my life right now? What do I do when I see that my whole world perhaps has just caved in? seems like the promises of God are never going to be fulfilled in my life. What do I do? You just keep trusting God. You just keep putting one foot in front of the other. I wonder this morning if I'm speaking to somebody, you feel that. You have felt that rejection. You have felt that hurt in your heart. And you need a touch from God. Will you let us pray with you before we go? lift up your hand and say, that's me, I need to touch. Okay, hold up your hand. Anybody else? Can I ask the church to do something this morning? Can I ask some of the women to come? Pray for Darcy. Pray for Maria over here. They need a miracle. They just need somebody to to help them through a difficult time, to love them. Maria is right over here by Glinda, Glinda's daughter. Just pray for them. Just be their family for them right now. May they be encouraged in the Lord. If God gives you a word for them, give it to them. Let the gifts of the Spirit be released. Thank you, Jesus. Anybody else here you need a financial miracle? Anybody here need a financial miracle? up on the first of year taxes and all that maybe you're looking at something and say man I don't know how I'm going to get through this thing anybody here need a financial miracle we just want to pray with you God is able God is able if you need a financial miracle the Bible says one of the greatest ways to get it is to give 